Hello everybody, welcome to the County Seat. I'm your host, Chad Booth. Today we are going to tackle one of the most precious resources in the West. As a matter of fact, most people think it is the most precious resource. It's not gold, it's not silver, it's not oil, it's water. We'll be talking about the Colorado River uh, allocations and the compact and the fact that it's coming up for some uh, renegotiation and how Utah is preparing to handle that. First, let's get a little background on what the Colorado River Compact is. Water is one of the most valuable resources in the Western United States. And as the region continues through a historic 20-year drought, managing the water that flows in the Colorado River Basin is more important than ever. The Colorado River drains 246,000 square miles with an annual average flow of 13 and a half million acre feet. Between 36 and 40 million people depend on water from the river. The Bureau of Reclamation manages the river and its reservoirs. We are the water agency in the Department of Interior. And the fact that we are in charge of managing, and developing, and protecting water resources and, and other uh, related resources for the American public. To control and store the water, many dams, canals, reservoirs, and pipelines have been built, including Lake Mead and Lake Powell. When full, Lake Powell can hold 24 million acre feet of water. But as of August of 2020, Lake Powell is only at 48% capacity. One acre foot of water can provide currently a modern family's needs for three years. In 1922, the seven states of the basin signed the Colorado River Compact, which allocated water rights to each state. The 1922 compact was a way for, the, for all the states in the Colorado River Basin to have a fair access for development of the water resources in their states. Now, the upper basin states they're actually the supply side of the, of the river. It's where all the headwaters exist. And then the lower basin states, they were the big users of the water. The numbers for these allocations were based off of measurements in the years prior to 1922. It is now believed that period was one of the wettest on record, and the basin rarely sees as much water as those numbers were based upon. Based on that uh, hydrology that they had records to, they, they came to the conclusion that the Colorado River had somewhere about 17 and a half million acre feet of water yield that they could uh, use. Uh, we now realize that those assumptions were far too high for realistic on what the river is uh, providing. As things have become drier and not as wet as those years, uh, that is where we're seeing a lot of the problems on the management of the river and how we consume that water. The 1922 compact broke up allocation between the upper and lower basin states. The upper basin states of Utah, Wyoming, Colorado, and New Mexico are entitled to 7.5 million acres per year. The lower basin states of California, Arizona, and Nevada are entitled to another 7.5 million acre feet per year and Mexico is to receive one and a half million acre feet per year. Glen Canyon Dam was built uh, specifically to help the upper basin states have that uh, assurance that they could have the water for their cities and uh, farmlands. So Lake Powell is that savings account. And so we provide under the long-term operating criteria 8.23 million acre feet. After 20 years of drought and reservoir levels dipping below half capacity, meeting those allocations is becoming more difficult. In 2007, interim guidelines were put in place for managing the resource, but now those guidelines are coming up for review. The interim guidelines will come to an end in 2026. And so this last year we've been evaluating how well the interim guidelines have been working. We will, between the basin states and the water users, we will be coming up with options on how we might improve uh, a new interim guideline for operations. 
In March 2021, Utah Governor Cox declared a state of emergency with 90% of the state experiencing extreme drought conditions. The state of emergency brings with it additional funding and implements water saving measures. But many are wondering, is this state of drought the new normal? Well, I would say the new normal is the normal. Whether the future holds more water returning to the river or worsening drought, it's important to prepare for the worst while hoping for the best. For the county seat, I'm Derek Dowsett. So that brings us from 1922 to the present. Where do we go in the future? We will discuss that with our guest when we come back on the county seat. Welcome back to the county seat. We are um, visiting with uh, the Colorado River Commissioner, uh, Gene Shawcroft, who is also the general manager of the Central Utah Water Conservancy District. Uh, thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Happy to be here. What is this commissioner all about? Now, recently you've heard about a bill, a lot of money, but the commissioner, is, is that a new position? The commissioner position has existed for many, many years. Uh, since 1922, each state, each of the seven Colorado River Basin states have had a representative appointed by the governor to serve as the commissioner and represent their respective state on issues dealing with the Colorado River. So that position has been in, in play for many, many years. Uh, recently, in January, Governor Cox asked me to serve as that river commissioner, which I'm happy to do because my life is all about water. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we had a brief chance to do a little history before, and yes, not only his life, but his ancestors' lives seemed to be all surround, surrounding water. Um, so with all this new emphasis, what resources are brought to the commissioner? Uh, I mean, this used to be an individual person who would probably meet with the commissioners of the other states, and they'd haggle a little bit and, and you know, work out the details of the compact or make sure that everybody was complying. How has that changed with this? The, the, this, this legislative session, the legislature created the Colorado River Authority of Utah for the purpose of being able, as you mentioned, to bring more resources to the table. Rather than a, a handful of folks at the state who had many, many other things on their plate, this Colorado <clears throat> River Authority creates an opportunity for full-time people to dedicate to nothing but the Colorado River. Many of the other states have full-time staff that work exclusively on the Colorado River and uh, the legislature felt that it was time for Utah to do the same. So we're in the process of establishing this authority as we speak. So given your experience in water, I, I mean, I, I know a lot of legislators, and there's some of them that would look at this and say this is bureaucratic creep, uh, it, you know, because we've got people covering it and they're juggling other jobs. Why is this more important now? Well, part of the, part of the reason has to do with the stars lining up, one, obviously, that has, has our full attention is growth. There will be twice as many Utahns in the next 60 years as there are today. And my experience with water is they'll all want a drink of water. And so part of the, part of the effort is to bring technical folks, um, attorneys, hydrologists, engineers, that have not been at the table, bring additional resources to the table so that we can be better prepared to understand how we use our water, where we use our water, how we can use it more efficiently to stretch this water supply as far as we possibly can. So it's a broader picture than just protecting and battling for the resources of the Colorado River and, and the allocations. That's, that's soon up for renegotiation, is it Correct. Let me, let me just clarify, one of the things that probably is a little bit misunderstood is what renegotiation is all about. Uh, in 1922, the river was divided upper and lower. And so the lower basin states, Arizona and California and uh, Nevada, got about half of the water, which was about seven and a half million acre feet. Then the upper basin states got the other half. In 1940, by 1948, it was obvious that there wasn't 15 million acre feet in the river. So when the 1948 compact was passed, which was among the four upper basin states, their allocation was divided not by quantity, but by percent. 
And so Utah got 23% of the water that remained after the seven and a half million was delivered to the lower basin states. The whole idea of the compact was to make sure that those states who developed a little bit later, generally the upper basin states, could develop on their schedule rather than have to compete with the water for the states that were developing much faster. And so that's, that is what the 1922 and 1948 compact did. Now when we talk about renegotiation, we're not talking at all about changing the allocation to the lower basin states or the upper basin states. We're simply saying in 2007 there was criteria established to operate Lake Powell and Lake Mead so that it benefited most of the folks most of the time. Now, Lake Mead's a lower, uh, a lower basin state water impoundment, is it not? Correct. And, and, then, and then Powell is an upper state. Correct, but, it, but it's not, the, the upper basin states don't control Lake Powell and the lower basin don't control Lake Mead, they're operated conjunctively. And that's what was agreed to in the 2007 operating criteria. That 2007 operating criteria had a sunset date because they weren't sure of all the complexities and how they would all be put together. So they said, let's run it from 2007 to 2025 so we can learn how we can operate these reservoirs conjunctively to maximize its use. So what we're renegotiating is the, the plumbing, if you will, how these two reservoirs operate conjunctively based on the things we've learned since 2007. Okay, we're going to take a quick commercial break. We'll pick up and talk about some of the uh, challenges and, and the usage patterns when we come back. Talking about water, the uh, clear liquid gold of the West on the county seat. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the county seat. We're talking about water, the Colorado River Compact, upper states, lower states, and the water that is distributed with uh, Gene uh, Shawcroft. Gene, I, I do have a, a question that I, I think a, a lot of people would look at. If they look at the numbers and, and they're seeing 13 plus million acre feet and, and they look at that distribution, that doesn't seem like enough water to uh, support a place like the Wasatch Front. How do you deal with that? That is correct. The, most of the cities along the Wasatch Front have their own water supplies. Some of them are surface, some of them are groundwater, and they use those to meet their daily demands. As growth continues and as growth occurs, then our project is supplemental, meaning added to, and we've been delivering uh, Colorado River water into the Wasatch Front, when I say we, the water community, um, as early as the mid-40s through the, the Deer Creek Project, which brings water from the Colorado River. The Central Utah Project then is in addition to that, but came on years later, and about two-thirds of the water that's delivered into Salt Lake County is physical water out of the Colorado River. Or, or available from water from the Colorado River. Uh, that's an interesting. Uh, that's an interesting s statistic because uh, that paints a picture that uh, there's no pipeline that's coming out of Flaming Gorge to deliver that water. So does does that mean that that water is counted as part of Colorado River water if it never reaches the Colorado? That's correct. If if the water is generated in the Colorado River basin. So as you drive from, from Heber City toward Duchesne, as you drive over Daniel's Summit, you cross from the Great Basin, which water flows obviously to the Great Salt Lake, over the divide into the Colorado River Basin. So water from Daniel's to the east is all physically located within the Colorado River Basin. And so as water is taken from that basin into the Wasatch Front, that's considered to be part of Utah's allocation of the Colorado River water. Between the commissioners of the different state, they have to, they have, to have a certain degree of, of honesty because they can't quantify the, the water that's in the river and if they're taking it 
Is that part of the 13 million acre feet or is, is that in addition to it? No, no, the water that comes, all of the water that comes out of the Colorado River Basin is counted toward Utah's allocation of Colorado River. There are other diversions on the river from, from Flaming Gorge down, but the majority of the water that's taken out of the Colorado River is, is actually taken before it gets to the Colorado River. Let's take just, just one quick minute and, and give me an update on uh, the uh, Lake Powell Pipeline. The Lake Powell Pipeline is an important project to the state of Utah. Um, the, the process is occurring, the, the NEPA process is occurring now. They're answering questions that were brought up um, under the draft environmental impact statement that was put together. So the state of Utah, Washington County, and, and the Bureau of Reclamation are working conjunctively to answer those questions. Um, that, uh, as you know, the southwest part of our state is very, very thirsty, very dry. They have one source of water, which is the Virgin River. And in order for the community to continue to grow, they will need an additional source of water. And so the Lake Powell Pipeline is an option for them to get water from, directly from the Colorado River into their area. There were a lot of people originally a uh, part of that pipeline project and backed out. I believe Kane County backed out. I know Iron County did. Uh, it, if the pipeline gets built and it's able to over deliver, w is there a possibility they could come back into that uh, compact and, and or into that distribution system? I'm assuming they could. Uh, I'm not, I haven't been directly involved on the day-to-day -day planning of Lake Powell Pipeline. I focus more on the, the amount of water that could be potentially delivered from the Colorado River into that area. So I haven't been involved on the day-to-day -day operations down there, but generally speaking, um, if there are sources and need, they seem to tend to match up over time to make sure those who need water have a way to get it. We're gonna take another quick break. We'll be right back, continue our conversation. Right now I'm wishing we had an hour for this program. You're watching The County Seat. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The County Seat. We are uh, having a discussion with Gene Shawcroft with the drought declaration that has just been placed and with obviously a weather pattern that is either permanent and, and uh, you know, climate created or is just part of the regular cycle of, of wet and dry, what do we do? Uh, this obviously puts more stress on, on everybody uh, for these long-term projects. That's a, great, that's a great question because as we look at hydrology, um, even this year, it, it continues to get worse. The, the projections of inflow into Lake Powell continue to drop each time they do a projection. And so I think the important thing um, really is to understand that even though the river has produced less than was anticipated, there has never been a shortage in the upper basin. Um, part of that's because we haven't developed all of our water. And so there is still room to develop more water in the upper basin. Um, and, and that's important for us to understand. However, with that being said, we need to be very, very cautious about how we use our water. We must do a better job of conserving. We've done a lot of things in the state, which I would call low-hanging fruit, to do the easy things first. Additional things will be necessary. There's not one entity that controls how everyone uses their water, however. And so we need to have a very a very good relationship with the communities that actually use the water to encourage a rate structure that incentivizes conservation, uh, other types of land use planning, for example. Lots are much smaller than they used to be just because of market conditions. And many of those lots now are being developed with landscape that uses a lot less water than what was developed in the past. And so we will have to do, be very aggressive about how we use our water and how we develop into the future in order for us to make sure we've got water for additional folks. Fortunately, we're in a situation in Utah where there is a lot of grass. And over time, with new construction, the amount of grass will diminish and that water use necessary for those large, larger 
yards will be diminished as well. On a, on a bigger scale, there's, a, there's an argument um, that there's agricultural water and there's, uh, there's culinary water, and um, they, they both are important because without the agricultural water, we don't eat. Correct. Um, how, how, does, how, did you, how does that fit into the picture? Most, that's a great question because um, more than half, close to 80% of our water in Utah is used for agricultural purposes. So people think, well, if we just took 5% more, we'd be able to satisfy all of our future um, municipal needs. The challenge is most of that 80% of water that is used for agricultural purposes is used in areas where it's not economically feasible to bring it into the Wasatch Front or into the growing areas. Many of those changes from agricultural uses to municipal uses along Wasatch Front have occurred over the last 50, 60 years. And that's all been done on a market-based condition, which frankly is the most efficient and the most productive way for those transitions to occur. And so that will continue in areas where there is agricultural use along the Wasatch Front that will be developed. Those conversions will continue to occur. So the guy running crop circles out in, uh, um, uh, you know, pivots out in, you know, Millard County. Correct. He doesn't need to worry too much about, uh, about his being appropriate, his water being appropriated to go uh, build another subdivision? It would be very difficult physically to get that water from those, those circles into the Wasatch Front. Uh, prohibitive at this time, no question. Okay. So um, what do you see as the biggest challenge in the future as we're coming up to, uh, you know, reviewing with the uh, Colorado River Commission, uh, you know, how allocation takes place? Do you think it's going to all go to a percentage, or do you think that fixed rate is going to stay on the lower States. No, the, the, the renegotiation we're involved with right now, as I mentioned, is, is not dealing with allocation. Uh, those allocation, if, th if there ever is uh, an opportunity to reallocate the river, that will be a very, very extensive process and, and very broad. What we're trying to do now is what has been done over the last hundred years on the river, and that's take little bits at a time, what we can handle today, what we can figure out among the seven states that is beneficial to most of the people most of the time. There's no question we will continue to focus on, on um, growth. All, of, all seven states are growing. All seven states are needing more water. And unfortunately, Mother Nature hasn't cooperated a lot lately and produced the kind of water that we anticipated years ago. And so there will be um, many opportunities for us to meet with the other states, to put our heads together. There are some very, very sharp people that sit behind the commissioners that help with technical information, that help with uh, studies, technologies improving dramatically. And how we measure water and how we use it can continue to be more efficient based on the technology that's being, that's being developed. Um, many of us now have smart timers, for example, in our homes uh, where, we, where we can set how often we water, uh, the duration of how, how long we water, mm -hmm. many of those kinds of things, technology that didn't exist years ago. So there is, there is hope coming for the future. There is always hope. There is always hope because as a society, we're very intelligent. As a society, we're very nimble. Um, in the water community, that's no different. We, we know that the demands are coming. We have been successful in managing this precious resource for many, many years. We will continue to do that. All I don't know today is exactly how that will happen. But I have every confidence that we've got the right folks around the table uh, across the West to make wise decisions as, we, as to how we go about maximizing the use of this precious resource of the Colorado River. Well, hope is a good word to end the conversation on. Thank you so much for joining us today on the county seat. Remember, local government, uh, and in this case, uh, state water government, is where your life happens. It's very important. Stay abreast of the issues. Check us out online. We'll see you later on the county seat.
Thank you for watching The County Seat. Be sure to subscribe and turn on your notifications to keep up to date on the program and happenings around Utah.